All right, we're recording. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, welcome everyone. This is uh, Bob Hegner. We're going to call the um, calling the finance committee together uh, for uh, to meet uh, to discuss three items on the budget. Uh, one is the police uh, department. Second is Department of Public Works. And the third is a brief discussion of the Amherst Regional Public Schools. Um, for those of you listening, we're not going to vote on anything today. So um, if your, um, you know, your public comment is such that you expect to vote, uh, please, uh, we are not going to vote on anything today. Um, so this meeting is being called, um, it's being uh, held remotely. Um, so the first thing I need to do is go around the committee and make sure everyone can hear me and be heard. So, uh, Kathy? Yes, I'm here. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Haneke? Present. Bernie? I'm here. Andy Steinberg? Here. Matt Holloway? Could you, uh, I didn't hear you, Matt. Can you hear me, present? Okay, great. Okay, so everyone, uh, we do have a, a uh, quorum of the committee, although uh, one member is missing. Um, and so let me, first thing on our item is public comments. And uh, if there are any, uh, Athena, did you want to? Yes, if I may, um, just for members of the public who are listening, we're going to do police first, and then at about 2.30, we're going to look at DPW budget, and then 3 o'clock, we're scheduled to do the regional, uh, have a discussion on regional schools, just for people who are listening in and maybe in, more interested in one item than another. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to open this up to public comment now. Um, see if uh, I don't see anyone from the attendees. If you are an attendee and you wish to make a public comment, pre please raise your hand uh, and I'll recognize you. Um, I three, see three members of the public. I uh, do not see any hands. So uh, why don't we, I'll close a public comment for now. And uh, if we have time, I will see if people have any other comments, but Let's uh, focus now on the budget review, uh, police. Andy, did you wanna take the lead on this? I can, but um, I think that we're, it's pretty straightforward and uh, we sent in questions, some which came from the two of us who were um, specifically assigned, the way that we work it for the benefit of anybody listening is, is that uh, members of the committee are assigned to develop, assure that there's a thorough review and develop questions. And uh, Bob Hegner and I shared that duty on uh, public safety budget quit lines, and um, but other members of the committee can also submit questions in their group together so that uh, the document that we've received uh, is a comprehensive set and I appreciate the responses that we received already. I don't know, Bob, would you like to just uh, um, have one of us go um, work with uh, Chief Ting and uh, go through the questions to see if there's anything that people want to ask a supplemental or how would you like to handle it that would be that would be great um can you you can start off andy and then if you want to hand it off to me at some point i'll take it from there do we uh would it be helpful to have um athena put the document on the screen of the responses the questions sure. responses and i know uh, Alicia's here too by the way <laughs> oh yes alicia uh, Councilor Walker, uh, just wanted to make sure you can hear us and we can hear you. Uh, yes, thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're all set then. So, uh, Chief Ting, welcome. I see that you have uh, uh, Officer Young with you also, uh, but welcome. And uh, maybe what we should do is just go through the questions and uh, 
see if there are any follow-up questions on responses rather than try and go reading through them unless you have any introductory comment that you would like to make, but we really want to just jump in and focus pretty much on the budget. Uh, thanks, Andy. I'm fine with just jumping in. I know that we're limited on time and there's a lot of questions to go through, so uh, I'm good to go as soon as you are. Okay, so um, we see in the on the screen, the first part is uh, um, some building questions and um, they were um, couple of uh, responses there and I uh, I don't have any follow-up as any members of the committee do or can't see all of the uh, participants Let's see if I can can't. no hands up okay then let's move on Holly, you have a question? Um, I was just going to clarify under the electricity cost, that question, so are the costs offset by the solar panel? Um, so Sean managed that. There are um, almost every department sees some sort of a, a um, credit on their monthly bill. The police department does. Their budget is net of the credits. Um, we have not increased the electricity line down there in quite some time, assuming that the costs were eventually going to start going down. Thank you. So, Bob, do you want to take over? Because like, really, it's a, really a chairing function at this point. And just uh, a, uh, a sure. Scroll. sure, I can I can take over. Um, the next question was on series of questions were uh, on uh, staffing operations um, and uh, we had some issues or some question about proposed increases which uh, and overtime pay I think uh, Captain Ting it would be helpful to talk a little bit about overtime because it does seem to be uh, you know one issue that the police department uh, you know is always uh, kind of has extra or has a need for overtime more than other departments. I'm sorry. Can we pause for just a moment? I just um, received word that Amherst Media is having a, a connectivity issue. Um, okay. Sorry for the delay. Should be just a moment. Thanks for your patience. Holly, I, I noticed your hand is still up. But if oh. Okay, just I I left it. it up, but I I will help Gabe with the questions um in terms of the uh salaries and overtime. Okay, when we're ready.
Thanks for your patience. They're working on a playback issue. Okay, we're good to go. Thank you for your patience, everyone. It, uh, Chief Ting, can you uh, maybe talk about overtime a little bit and then Holly, you can chime in. Uh, sure, yeah, I can talk about overtime. Um, if we're talking about within the past year or so, you know, we have had a dramatic uh, decrease in staffing. Um, where at one point we had 38 officers in total, where we were slated for 46 officers. And at the peak in my career, I think we've seen 52 officers at one point. Um, so we have been at our lowest point, um, as far as I can remember, throughout my career. So 38 officers, if you take a look at that breakdown, um, 13 of the officers are in a supervisory position. Uh, we have five uh, patrolmen that are assigned to the detective bureau. Uh, one's a neighborhood liaison officer and one is an administrative officer. So that leaves us with, um, uh, forgive me on my math, I think 17 officers to handle every single shift, in which we have a minimum mandatory on every shift of three officers and one supervisor and one officer in house. Um, and so that's contractual. So we have to maintain those levels uh for our minimums and therefore uh because we only have so many officers to go around in terms of filling those shifts our overtime has been extremely high in in the past year or so uh to the point where we have uh supervisors that are now covering some of our patrol shifts which is really rare uh in the past that used to be um you know a once in a while type of occurrence uh but now uh, we're starting to see that it's a lot more prevalent until we have our numbers up. And our numbers are increasing. Uh, we currently have uh, uh, we have three officers that are on field training. Uh, we have two officers that are going into the academy and we are replenishing our numbers. So that, that number should decrease in terms of overtime for coverage purposes. Um, relative to... Uh, other types of overtime, I think the question here was a uh, discussion about what type of overtime, and that really depends. Um, uh, I think the question was, can we quantify and track the time and cost of police hours um, for noise on campus and on campus events uh, relative to overtime? When we assign overtime to officers, it isn't specific to just handling quality of life issues. We ask the officers to respond to any call, so we do not quantify that. Um, certainly, we can do that down the line if that's something that's being requested, but at this point in time, we don't do that. Um, so overtime is, uh, this year, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's okay. exceeding, so hopefully that kind of answers that. Any other follow-up questions relative to that? Holly, did you want to? Add to yeah. that? Yep. So I can, I'll just quickly talk about a couple of things. So um, the one of the question was the proposed increase is 6.6% in the FY25 budget. Um, what I wanted to do was just explain that a little bit. So what happened is in FY24, when the budget was put together, the police unions were operating without a contract. So last 
fiscal year's increase was not worked into their budget. So although this appears like it's a really large increase compared to some of the other departments, this is basically also making up for the fact that last year their contract was not settled. So we had to increase it by the amount of last year's contract and then also increase it for the FY25 contract. So it does have a bit of a snowball effect when the budgets are set with contracts not being in place. When the contract is not in place, that additional estimated cost of their um, COLAs goes into a holding Hot. It, it goes just into the employee benefits line, waiting to see what their contract gets settled at and what that percentage was be, will be before it is allocated out to their um, specific department. So this, I mean, it, it is a large increase, but it is also the sort of the net effect of two years worth of increases because last year's COLA was not worked into the budget figures. So that's why you see that as being a little bit higher this year. Um, and then there was, I think the question was, was there also a question of how much um, is overtime in this budget? I thought I read that somewhere. Um, so the the overtime budget for the police department is set at about $293,000. Um, that has increased very, very little over the years. I just went back and looked in the, like a 10 year history and that's only gone up about $30,000 in 10 years on their overtime budget. Okay, thank you. Bernie, you had a question? Yeah, um, just to uh, Chief uh, Ting, welcome to the uh... Welcome to the welcome to the wide world of budgetary questioning. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> I, I always looked at um, just to start. I've always looked at staff police overtime as sort of like an exercise, like reading the tea leaves. Mm. Uh, one bad case can throw um, one serious case can throw your overtime way off, and it seems like we've been able to avoid um, real ups and downs. So if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, a good part of the overtime budget right now is due to open positions that are being filled and not demand, not extra need for extra police office uh, hours. Um, is is that fair? Uh, very much so. I mean, the, the thing is, is, uh, you know, so we've lost a few, our turnover rate has, has been extreme in the past few years in comparison to uh, a decade ago, and that's for a multitude of reasons. Uh, most recently, we've lost uh, a ton of officers to the state police. So as I think everybody here knows, recruitment and retention is a major issue in policing across the country. Um, so right now, it, there is really a lack of people who want to become police officers. So that pool is really small. So across Western Mass, all of our agencies in Western Mass are fighting from that same pool to try and get recruits in. So part of it is timing. Um, it takes a solid year, at least for us to get an officer on the road. Um, it's expensive. Uh, we did a case study in terms of how much it costs to get a recruit onto the road. And it's approximately $25,000 per recruit just to get them outfitted, trained properly, and to get them out on the road. So it's a huge expense. And especially when the state police comes around and they put out an exam, uh, we usually lose a number of officers. So most recently we lost four in the past couple of months directly to the state police. So we have to replenish that. And it takes us a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort. And the other question I had relative to overtime is, is part-time. Um, yeah, how do you see, um, Part time is impacting the department. How do you have a what what kind of relationship does the department have with the district attorney's office about pulling officers uh, into court for lengthy periods of time? So we have a very strong relationship with the DA's office, and uh, actually our figures for um, part time has dropped dramatically. Um, you know, we have we're in an age of we're, we're trying to de-escalate and find other means other than having to criminally either cite or arrest somebody. So our court time is dramatically decreased uh, to the point where it's, you know, that's that's where we have some savings within our budget is court time. Super. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, your hand is still up. Did you? Sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Kathy, did you have a question or a comment earlier? Uh, no, it got answered. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Chief, maybe it's, it's I'm, I'm just thinking it would probably be more efficient for you to just go through the, the questions and talk in general about, I mean, we can all read the responses to the questions. But more talk maybe a bit more generally. I mean, I can see some issues. Um, I mean, I would like you to talk about the level of staffing at 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 full staffing, whether that's uh, sufficient for covering the town, or whether you would prefer to have uh, additional officers. Um, talk about working with Crest because that's obviously a an issue that. Mm. Um, you know, people are very much interested in. Um, and, um, you know, maybe you can just go through some of the other questions uh, as, as the, you know, as we, as they uh, are listed here on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the document. Sure. In, in terms of staffing, you know, if you were asking me if I had a wish list in terms of how many officers I could get, you know, certainly, uh, I would ask for as many as possible. Um, you know, I take a look at, uh, you know, in terms of staffing issues, is it enough? Is it viable? Um, I think our department, uh, the culture, and in terms of how much we do, I think we do a lot more with very little that we have. Um, if I had my wish, I would have at least 75 officers. I think we could do a tremendous amount uh, with 75 officers or even to be honest with you, if we got to the level of like 55, it would be fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of outreach that I envision our department to be able to accomplish. I would love to have an outreach team. I would love, love to have a, um, a, a traffic unit to be able to respond to all the different complaints that we have across town. I think that's probably one of our largest areas of complaints, which is traffic and traffic responsibilities. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we would love to be able to do. Um, we would love to have a community policing unit uh, to be able to satisfy all of our goals. Um, but of course, again, that's a wish list. And um, we, uh, you know, we would like to see an increase in that down the line. But we are always uh, kind of playing catch up because of the turnover rate. Um, based upon what we had talked about uh, just a few minutes prior. Um, so what was the second half of the question there, Bob? Uh, it was, it really had to do with working with Cress and- Yeah, um... so working with Cress, you know, this this also is a work in progress. You know, as we all know, Camille just got on board. So we have some new leadership. There's also some new responders that are there that need to get up to speed. And, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. Something that I'm going to quote uh, Timmy Nelson from saying is that we're we're building a uh, a plane while it's flying in the air, and that's truly um, the case uh, at this point. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of things to to be ironed out. Uh, we have a very strong relationship with Cress. Um, we've developed a, a nice partnership with Camille and the fire department, and we're willing to do what whatever it takes to make sure that Cress is successful. I think that. You know, as an agency, uh, the Amherst Police Department has has been there uh, since the beginning in terms of supporting Cress. Um, so we are open to ideas. We I appreciate these questions that are being presented, um, but unfortunately, I don't have solid answers for all of the questions because again, we have new leadership and we are trying to work this out to make sure that that this works out as as properly as possible. Thank you, Kathy. Did you just question? Uh, yeah, um, I don't want to put you on the spot on this interaction, but th seeing seeing elements of what has usually been in your table, including community mm -hmm. policing, mm -hmm. could some of that be done in partnership with a member of Cress? And I know we have right now a, a model that says police do one thing and Cress does another completely. But having seen what your community police person does, which is a lot of uh, mediating and getting people to talk to each other around, well, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it, it's looking for, if we 
and this may be a larger, I'm looking for efficiencies where each group doesn't have to staff up for everything. Cause sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like you both may respond um, at a spring dance, the police show up and crest shows up because each has been called, you know, so, so it's that interaction and areas that's not by law required that only a police person does it. Um, is that clear? You know, think, and I'm thinking forward to think of efficiencies. Like we don't, yeah. we're I not going to, gonna, yeah. I'm sorry to be honest with you, Kathy. I mean, that's, that's a, we could probably spend hours on talking okay. about that yeah. subject alone. Um, and we are certainly open to different ideas to try and figure out what is the most efficient uh, processes to make sure that we all uh, operate productively and function correctly. So I know that the Crest Department is currently working on standardizing their, their policies and procedures. And that really is kind of uh, the structure that needs to be developed so then we can kind of play off of each other and figure out, you know, what calls are they going to? What calls are we going to? Um, the example that you talked about, the spring dance, I, I believe there was a domestic situation that was involved. So really anything with a, a crime element at this point is something that we are going to respond to. And anything with a, with a level of safety element where somebody could potentially get hurt is something that we are going to respond to. Um, but there are different models out there. Um, that we've seen from other cities that either have co-response or a program similar like CRESS where it's tiered, where depending on the call, you might get a CRESS member and a police member to respond. And then once you discover what's, what's, uh, what's detailing that particular call, you can call one or the other off of it. So these are all different options that we're taking a look at and exploring to try and figure out well, what works best for the town of Amherst. Okay, and, and I didn't, I see Andy saying, Bob, I think it is a longer discussion. So it's mm -hmm. one, I just want to include our, in our, be, sh be sure we ask it as a question in our report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Andy? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, she, when I, I'm reflecting back on uh, last year's meeting that was the uh, same meeting, just different grouping and different time. And with uh, Chief Livingstone, and when we were talking about the chart that's, I think, on page 120, that shows the number of personnel in the department, mm. I think that the, is, is I understood his response at the time was that he uh, said that the a number of um, employees shown in the organizational chart was what he considered to be the number that was absolutely necessary in order to be able to assure on a 24 seven basis that there are enough officers available uh, to respond to any crisis situation in town where there was a potential um, of a safety risk for either responding officers or for the public at large. And uh, so I guess the, the um, when I just wanted to make sure that I understood his response correctly and that it's, um, if so, that you feel that it's a correct response. Um, I don't know if he specified a number, Andy, or not. Uh, I don't recall that. Um, so I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I don't really recall what his response was in terms of what he felt was uh, safe enough for our police department to police this community. Um, you know, certainly I think at this current level right now, it is not safe uh, entirely. We are um, struggling at in many junctures. Uh, like I said earlier, we have supervisors that are that are taking up patrol shifts, and that's that's a very unusual circumstance. And, you know, when you talk about burnout and the amount of uh, um, time that our officers are expending, you know, it certainly will affect their performance to a degree. Um, we're a professional agency and we are trained extremely professionally. However, we're talking about the human element that, that takes a toll on our officers and our personnel. Uh, certainly morale gets affected. 
so these are all things in their personal well-being. So these are things that we take into consideration uh, to be able to produce the best um, customer service and product that we can produce for the public. So these are all things that that are taken into consideration. Yeah, of course, you had previously uh, said, and I think uh, about particular challenges that you are confronting right now because of turnover, because of uh, the uh, that have required you to use overtime for mm -hmm. um, just meeting routine shift requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess the question I was really trying to get at is assuming that uh, all of the positions could be filled and we were back in uh, the turnover question was taken care of by new hires who had met the training requirements, is the number that is shown um, the number that would provide the, at that point, the adequate coverage because uh, we can't, you know, I'm, Fortunately, we do have to deal with the uh, turnover. And I mm. guess but then I would have a follow-up question to after you've responded. Um, so, you know, we are at 46, we'll be 100%. I guess your question is, is, is that adequate? Um, I personally would, I think if we had 50 or more, would be adequate at the very least. So if we, even at, at 46, we are still struggling in many areas. And with that 50, and this will, I hope this will be my last question, would, would that increase also then provide a buffer so that when there's turnover, there's, a, there's staff available to more completely fill in at the time that uh, we are dealing with the turnover issues? I think it would. I think it would, you know, if we had 50 officers and then uh, if we lost a few here and there, we would, um, we'd still have enough to maintain our minimum mandatory shifts and uh, the amount of overtime would certainly decrease. So I think it would be very beneficial. And at the patrolman level who are coming in, their, you know, their base pay is pretty low. So it certainly um, is cost effective. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions. The next couple of questions are about really the, the dispatch, the communication center. Um, one is uh, that um, we had um, some increases in budget. Uh, presumably it's because of what Holly explained. Uh, we also, there was um, a drop in radio transmissions and the response was that um, you know, there, there's, you know, we're at a, basically, I, I, it seems like we're at a minimum mandatory staffing level standard for the, for the communication center. Is that correct? Uh, so we have Jason Rushford on here and he is, uh, he's representing our communication center. Jay, you want to chime in on this one? And uh, Bob, just a quick time check. We're at 235 right now. Okay. Hi, Bob. Yeah, we're staffed at fully right now at 12 positions. That's including Mike Curtin as the supervisor and two lead dispatchers underneath him, and then nine dispatchers to work the line. Uh, we are fully staffed at that right now. We have a minimum of two dispatchers on per shift. Uh, we try to do three whenever possible, and at some points there's a mandatory of three on duty uh, minimum for busy weekends, busy times. Ideal staffing would be three on duty 24 seven, uh, but it'd make our jobs a lot easier, a lot better for the residents calling in, a lot more continuity of calls, a whole host of things we could get into. Um, we can work with two, but that is our absolute minimum. Three would definitely be ideal. Thank you. Um, Chief, there's a couple of questions we have about um, well, one is about uh, the clinical support operations and, uh, you know, cl clinical co-response. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Just explain kind of how that's, what it, what is it and how, how is it working? It seems to be new this year. 
Sure, uh, sure. I, I invited uh, Captain Young to join us because he is uh, the head of our crisis intervention team and he is a lot more well, well versed on this. So this is not something new. Uh, but Captain Young, if you don't mind joining in. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, no, it, it's not new this year. Um, we, we've had a we've had a clinician assigned to the, to the agency for a number of years now. Um, kind of the genesis of it began almost 20 years ago when we adopted the jail diversion project and the CIT project. It would have been, that might not have been quite 20 years. I should, I could double check that 15, 16 years ago. And one of the essences of jail diversion, as the chief intimated earlier, um, was it that we, we try to deal with core problems and, and make referrals as opposed to taking, you know, taking criminal action and, and, and some of the, the low lying criminal responses that we have. Um, in about 2017 or 2018, I, I met with the Department of Mental Health and went to a couple of different larger agencies that were all employing co-response um, and saw what they were doing there. And the idea behind it is, is that police officers go and respond to the scene um, in concert with a trained, licensed clinical worker. You know, once the once the scene has been has been maintained, in other words, safety is no longer an issue. The clinician and the police officer have a discussion about what's best for the client at that point. In many instances, the you know the person can be de-escalated at the scene, um, and then it all becomes resource driven. You know, quite frequently, our, our, we go with our clinician. The police officers make it you know make conversation or have conversation with that that clinician. She has, she has a wealth of experience at CSO prior to coming here. And, um, you know, we, we stay for safety reasons. There are other times when she feels comfortable to uh, remain behind without a police officer. In many instances, she meets with them at the ED. Uh, there, there are so many different avenues that we can do to provide services to people that are, have some type, of, um, some type of need short of arresting them and bringing them before the court where they can be ordered to order to, um, to some of the same services that they could get in real time. And that, that would, that's the real, that's the real basis of having a, a call responder is that they're actually provided with services in real time and not after there's an arrest made or citations mm -hmm. made, or in many instances, police officers didn't have the capabilities to, to deescalate at the scene. So we would section 12 them and bring them to the hospital. And this is a way to do that without having to be as quite as invasive. So Co-response is not new. Um, almost every agency here in Western Mass employs co-response to some degree. Hadley PD does, Northampton PD, East Hampton, Springfield Westside. I mean, I was meeting with Hoyle PD back in 17 and 18, and they were already, they already had co-responders responding with their with their cops at that time. So um, that's it in a nutshell. I'm, I could talk forever, and I know you guys are on a time constraint about it. Um, it's done so many wonderful things for our community. It's limited our arrests. You see, our number, our arrest numbers have depreciated. Um, we've changed the way some of one of the questions later on is: is why does our record keeping look differently? Where there's more assist citizens, and what I what I did over the last couple of years is I I went the original call that would have been something like a disturbance or a shoplifting one. We've recoded those um, because we have put less value on the need for criminal response and more need on for the welfare of the patient or the client. And that's, so that's why the numbers haven't really changed. It's, I just kind of mumbly pegged some of it so that I could bean count at a later time to see exactly how effective this was. Uh, bear in mind, our, the clinician doesn't work for us, right? So they work for CSO. So I, I have to have discussions with the supervisors at CSO about their effectiveness. And there's so many privacy concerns there, obviously. So we, sometimes we have to talk a little bit in code um, to make certain that the client's privacy is respected. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. My wife is a clinical psychologist, so I do understand uh, the issue of uh, of uh, privacy very much. It's it's very it's a very real thing, and we would never because not only do we put the client in a bind, we put the clinician in a bind too. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, the, there's a number of other questions here, but um, maybe in, in the inter interest of time. Um, maybe we could just focus on a couple. Uh, one is uh, there was a question about um, the the police cruisers and the costs of replacing them. And I know that we're trying to find hybrid cruisers uh, to replace the the gasoline cruisers. 
And the question is, what experience do we have? Do we have any sense of whether the hybrid cruisers will last longer so we won't need to replace them as often? Um, will we get any savings other than, you know, the gas mileage or will we, you know, is it just really a gas mileage that, that we're going to, we're going to see, uh, lower costs for? Well, that's hard to determine only because the hybrid technology is, is still relatively new. When I say it's new, it's been out there, uh, for consumer products, but for police packages, it's not as new. Um, so we face a lot of challenges. You know, ultimately, we would like to see all of our vehicles to be electric, uh, but certainly that technology is not caught up yet uh, for police vehicles. So right now we are uh, a little bit hindered by only using hybrid uh, technology. And so far, um, you know, we use Ford products and Ford, we use Ford products simply because that is the uh, that's the number one uh, company that that supplies for the police demand um, for services and for the product itself. So, so far, I we haven't quantified it. You know, certainly we've seen uh, cost savings in fuel usage, um, but in terms of how long they last, that kind of remains to be seen. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a large enough sample to be able to give you a valid answer to that. Sure. Uh, but so far, they've been pretty good. They've been holding up very well. Chief, if I could just chime in there too, that the primary reason why we use Ford as well is because of all the gear that we put in there. It would be such an enormous cost if we had to retrofit. So long before Chief Ting was in charge, the decision was made that that was the product we were going to go with. So we're kind of, it's kind of like the guy who has one suit and buys new ties. We're kind of in the same boat right there. It, it, the, that ret the retrofit cost would be enormous if we went to Chevrolet or some other some other source. Yeah. Just, just uh, you know, uh, uh, an aside. But my my wife and I used to live in in Northern Virginia, and there was a small town there called Falls Church. And uh, there was a guy, you know it. Okay, so the, the guy, there was a guy there who now happens to be their their member of Congress, but he at the time was just a, a business owner, and he owned a Volvo dealership. Oh. So we got when we went into to Falls Church, we noticed all the police cruisers were Volvos. Holy smokes. Uh, Holy smokes. <laughs> she said, this must be a very wealthy town, but it turns out <laughs> we donated all of them to the town. So uh, <laughs> yeah, my 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 hometown, they were all Chevys. Um uh, but I'm I'm happy that uh, uh the whole retrofit piece was mentioned because that's um that's part of of that goes along with the the cars is moving all that stuff from one car to another. Uh, you can't Absolutely. just get down, buy one off the lot. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, is that while we don't hopefully never have to use them in a high speed chase, they have to be prepared to handle a high speed chase. And so, uh, you know, uh, yes, a hundred thousand miles is not bad for uh, my car, but for somebody who might have to chase someone and do it safely and carefully, a hundred thousand miles could be a, a, a losing proposition. Be honest with you, Bernie. We're trying to decrease any type of chases. Oh, chases! <laughs> yes, we yes, don't like, I, we don't I, like I the chases. It. The liability is uh, just too much. But uh, to be no, honest with all, you, you know, we all have to stop watching television. I think. Yeah. You know? <laughs> all right, and, Bob. You know, I, I just want to. I want to make us aware of the time. It's two forty-five, yeah, and we have another department. I, I understand. I understand. Okay. I'm trying to wrap it up. So, Thanks, um, Chief. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Uh, no, not at this time, but certainly, you know, if there's any other questions offline that anybody wants to ask, you know, well, I'm certainly available as well as Captain Young at any time. Okay. Well, thanks very much, gentlemen. Um, we're going to now move on to the DPW. Bernie, do you want to lead the charge on this? Sure. Um, Guilford um, and Thank you. were, you know, they, you're here somewhere? It's, they're, yeah. they're making their appearance. Okay. We're here. Uh, Amy's here. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, and thank you for, uh, I printed it out, 10 pages <laughs> of response. Um, so Gilfred, if you want to talk about the overtime budget, you can go ahead and do that, uh, at least in terms of responding to the finance committee. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you, in, in the interest of time, to kind of hit some of the highlights where you see strengths and weaknesses in the budget, where you want to uh, where you'd like the department to move to. 
but before we do that, I really want to uh, move the discussion off the usual uh, uh, paving potholes and snow removal and focus on uh, what you led in terms of with your response to questions of stormwater management and environmental issues uh, and where we stand in terms of, of those uh, of, of climate change and where are the environmental needs and regulations are beginning to really push the department in certain directions. Well, as, as I said, my response, I mean, we could do a whole presentation on just how the environmental rules and the, the environment is affecting the department right now. Um, we've, we've had meetings with other agencies and um, people kind of are amazed at how much we're involved in, in the environment every day. I mean, we're doing something, something we're doing is, is affecting the environment or being affected by the environment every day. It's just, it's just amazing. From our potholes to just operating the water and treatment, water treatment plant and the wastewater plants. Um, we could really talk a lot about that. We really do need to beef up our, our staffing in that area. We have, basically we have two people who work on most of that right now, and we need to really change that and add some more people. Um, our environmental scientists, it was recommended that, well, I recommended in my budget that our environmental scientist uh, position be augmented with a, a manager type position to oversee the environmental scientists and our lab technicians and our staff that's involving handling all our permits. Um, every, well, water, wastewater, they have a permit that we have to abide by, by DEP and EPA. Um, the landfill has an EPA and an, and a e, an EPA and a DEP permit as well. The landfill actually has three permits going on right now. Um, there's the landfill closure permit, there's the transfer station permit, and there's the permit for the flare, which is an air quality permit, which has to be taken care of all the time. So we, we have a lot going on. Um, highway has to deal with our conservation department and water water quality issues on the highway side. So th they're doing it as well. It's, it's, you don't do, we don't do basically anything. I said that really poorly and I apologize. <laughs> we, we everything we do is touched by it and everything we, we have to do has some type of interaction with some environmental group not just our conservation commission but our state and federal partners as well and the the uh, the other piece that uh, we, we sort of led with was the so-called nipties permit um uh the particular concern there is stormwater runoff of waste uh from the streets and uh, uh coming into compliance with uh, uh the epa's requirements so i mean the best the best thing i can tell you about that is read the answer to the question okay. that's from that's from beth wilson our environmental scientist she is pretty much managing the program for us right now she's late we have specific tasks we have to do. They're laid out and we have annual tasks. They're laid out in the answers. Um, and she, she's very, very good at what she does as well as everything else she's doing right now. And the other the other thing that I'd like you to discuss a bit, and I'm, I'm, you'll you'll get a ton of more specific questions, um, is the, the, the construction issues. Uh, the construction issues around finding a new home for the DPW uh, around water treatment and around the sewage treatment plants and the the infrastructure that connects those particular buildings. So the the new beach DPW building is going very slowly. Um, probably just just as a since you're the counselors, one of the issues we keep running into is there's no carve out in our zoning for municipal purposes. Um, you want to build a fire station, the fire station has to meet the same requirements as if you want to build a, a for-profit restaurant or diner or, or hotel. Um, this, these services and these facilities we're building are for the people of this town, to serve the people of this town. There's no profit. I get no profit sharing. I get, there's no, no profit whatsoever in this for us. So, I mean, we're not cutting corners or wanting to cut corners for mere profit and increasing our bottom line. We're really doing it to try to get something for the public that works within the budget they're demanding us to work in. So 
our zoning is totally against us in some cases. Uh, lot coverage, um, wetland, what you can do in a wetland buffer, what you can't do in a wetland buffer. Those are things that are totally um, something we can have a say in, but we choose not to as a community. Um, so we're having a hard time with that, with finding a DPW home. Our, our wastewater and water facilities, water is much better, in much better shape than wastewater right now. We were waiting to receive our permits from EPA and DEP on our wastewater side just to see what they were going to require us to do. Um, they actually had the could have what they could have done is made us do an awful lot of changes to our facility and changed our processes a great deal. But we were we kind of came out on the good side. We now we just need to upgrade our facilities and get ready for the next round of permits in five, 10. 20 years, but we will have some upgrades coming to the wastewater plant here, which are going to be costly. I, I just want to come in with a couple of facts on this because I've been putting together a report on wastewater. So I've been looking at the numbers and our wastewater treatment facility, it's 45 years old and there's a lot of equipment there that is original um, and it's in a harsh environment. And so we're kind of every day struggling to maintain that equipment. And our sewer system of all of the sewer collection system, 67% of the pipes in the ground are more than 50 years old. So two thirds of the pipes in the ground are more than 50 years old. Like we're fighting a battle because we haven't been able to get the funding in the past. And now we're at that critical point, um, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, well, and the wastewater treatment plan is also sort of like an ongoing chemistry experiment. Um, it is. It's a live never... living creature. Yeah. Uh, you got to keep the bugs happy. Yes. The bugs so, don't, aren't happy. The process so stops. We we have had a couple of uh, sewer overflows, fatbergs and the like uh, in the last year or so that uh, um, that's just a, you're, you're you're seeing that that's you're saying more of that is likely to uh, likely to occur. Um, or other, uh, again, how, how is that being managed? So for our overflows, one of our biggest over, overflow areas is one of our pump stations. Um, the pump station is pumping and, and the flow into the pump station is greater than what's being pumped out. And then it'll overflow at a couple of manholes farther down. The pump station doesn't stop or it still does its job, but the release is farther down the system. Um, we actually have that under contract for replacement and we'll be replacing that this summer. Um, so that one should get better. Um, we do have a lot of I and I we need to address and that's probably the bigger issue is addressing I and I um, as, the, as, as the rainstorms become more intense and we have more frequent rainstorms and less snow, we'll actually see more I and I and that'll cause us to have some more overflows as well. So that is something we are looking at. We have a contract out for some pipe lining, which is where you slip a, a reinforced plastic or fiberglass plastic uh, sleeve inside the pipe, you harden it and you make the pipe, you rejuvenate the pipe and you stop the leaks coming in. Mm -hmm. So we are working on that as well. Um, okay. For those watching at home, I and I is infiltration and inflow. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, never quite. It's water's getting in. It shouldn't be there. Right. Um, it, in, it, again, this has an impact on the um, on the funding uh, on our. Uh, uh, if we could uh, actually, if we could actually have a drought, we might actually see some positive on the M I and I because. Instead of inflowing in, the water table will drop low enough that the water in the sewer system will flow out of the pipes, X flow, and we would have some help. But I don't know if there's really a drought in our future right now to help us. Okay, but the, the impact on the enterprise funds here in terms of, of water and sewer, um, it looks like we should be expecting increases in those because of construction, because of in inflation, because of what? All three of those things are causing us <laughs> problems right now. We, the, we added $200,000 to the water and to the sewer uh, accounts just in the general O&M to cover the cost of equipment. Uh, equipment has skyrocketed in cost. Uh, wait times have increased. So 
inflation is a big a big issue for us right now. Um, and because the plant's older and we're replacing more things, we're being hit with those costs now. If we had done it 15 years ago, we'd be paying a cheaper cost, but we're not. We're paying the costs that we have now. So that yeah. inflation is our biggest issue right now as far as costs are going. All right. So once again, deferred maintenance means broken. Um, uh, Mandy, Joe, did you have your hand is up? Yes, I did. Um, a couple questions for some of the stuff that's gone over. But I think the first one is about rates and maintenance. Um, rates are on our agenda for, I believe, next week. So I, I'd like you to come prepared to talk about those rate increases and potential need for more rate increases as it relates to all of this maintenance that you've been talking about um, as we discuss the the water and sewer rates um, and and get towards making a recommendation on those for the next year and the year after and all. Um, Cause I think a lot of this conversation and what you're saying directly relates to what we've been charging and what we should be thinking about charging in the future. Um, and since we're on limited time, I wanna save all of that for that next meeting when it, it it's not, it's not, it's pertinent to this, but it's also pertinent to that. So I think we can put it off. In terms of the um, DPW headquarters and other things like that, um, I know a, a couple of years ago, I asked our manager and our assistant town manager about have they looked at proposing changes to zoning to make it easier to build a DPW, particularly some of those lot coverage lines for municipal services, because when you're looking at RO and RLD, you're every... 80, you know, every acre of coverage, you need like 10 acres of non-coverage, you know, because it's so low on lot coverage. But I guess my question for you is that it's twofold. One that was asked that was not answered in the documents. It was just left there, which is um, a, a statement of uh, implementing the next phase of DPW headquarters as recommended by the feasibility study. Does that mean in your mind that the department is unwilling to consider alternatives to the recommendation? Um, meaning, are you unwilling to consider multiple locations, different size, multiple stories, things, because the recommendation was an 80,000 square foot building on one floor. Um, if you consider multiple stories, you've decreased your lot coverage and all. And so the next question is also, have you talked to our conservation and development department, our manager, our assistant manager about the potential need for zoning changes in order to make it easier to potentially find sites to build a DPW because of the dimensional standards? And if so, where are those conversations or what were those responses uh, given your, what sounds like a little bit of frustration or um, you know, struggle with that issue? A discussion on on zoning and so forth that those discussions have been had with the town manager and the assistant town manager. They're quite brief discussions. They um if they have taken the information and worked on it, they have not passed it back to me. Um it's not um showing up anywhere else. As far as looking at alternate alternatives to the layout we have, we have looked at multiple stories, we have looked at multiple sites. Um, you have advantages and disadvantages to both of those. Um, the con contractor consultant we have working with us right now is wrapping up their study, and then we will be taking that to conservation and planning to talk about how to make this work in that area. Um, it, and it may, it may not, it may work, it may not work. Um, there's, there are concerns. And then we can sit down and discuss, once we do that, we can sit down and discuss possible ways of getting around it. Um, some some of them may mean we, some, some of the things that are going on may mean, yes, we actually do build four different buildings. So if you build four different buildings, you have four parking lots, four stormwater treatment systems, you have uh, staff space for four, four different buildings, which means showers, locker rooms, all, all separate things. Um, yes, they'll be smaller, but there's going to be a minimum size and they have to meet those requirements. So as you spread us out, if we decide to be spread out or the town so decides it, um, you're going to have to put all the amenities that are supposed to be there. There's going to have to be exhaust um, just like in a police in a fire station where you have the exhaust systems for every vehicle controlled and some type of positive ventilation system. There's going to be positive ventilation in every little building you build 
that has vehicles in it, where if you build one building with one system, you have you have some type of, <clears throat> you have, oh, the word just went in my head, not my head, sorry. I love getting older. But you have some econ economy of scale there when you do a big, bigger building. When you go smaller buildings, you start, you're going to have, there's going to be a size building, which doesn't matter how, how, how small it is, there's still this amount of money to put that exhaust system in it, whether it is twice that size or three times that size. Um, those are the things we're actually, I mean, we're seriously looking at and we have to look at. Um, I personally don't see, um, I'm not really sure how we're going to do this. I personally don't see it anymore, how we're going to do it. So it's really getting to be a little, a uh, little frustrating. Um, and, um, but we're looking at everything and, and to keep hearing people say we're not looking at things and we're refusing to look at things is, is even more frustrating. And I sorry to say it that way, but that's just the way I want to say it. Okay. Kathy, did you want to have a comment? Kathy, you're muted. That's it's a comment that is going to be brief because I'm conscious of time. Mandy Jo just opened up a big topic um, that can't be easily answered. And Guilford, part of what she was asking wasn't many buildings. It was one taller building and putting the equipment in a Ponset hut. So I'm not saying that you're not looking at options, but there is a starting to be, we might need a team to be looking at this. So I think, Bob, it, it feels to me there's another discussion that needs to happen and it can't happen in the contents of the budget. And it more, it, it bounced out to many of our attention because it says working on and we weren't sure we even had a place yet. So I, so I really think that this needs, it's a, a plea to the town manager to get an internal group. So my, my only other question, and I think you've answered it through this terrific document, is it looks like we don't have resources for repairing pipes for doing some of the basic things we have to do. And I don't know how much we've quantified that. So Mandy Jo asked, you know, as you as you look toward our sewer system and our pipes, um, if it's rate increases over several years, the more people ha can have an understanding that we've got these pipes are going to fall apart otherwise. Um, and, and I haven't, you may have those internal reports. So it's actually just doc creating documents for us to be able to use to explain to people what the backlog is. Um, and I also noticed that you said your salaries aren't necessarily competitive in the marketplace anymore, that we hire people, we train them, and then we lose them. So I think that is another trying to get a sense of staffing, uh, lack of staffing and key things because of turnover. And I, I don't that's not in the document right now, but you spoke to it. So I don't feel like we need a lot more information right now, Bob. I just think we need to flag these as budget concerns. Um, that I think that's, that's my main um, comment. And I will say just Paul in a general comment about the budget book, I like the fact that the enterprise fund shows us what the fringe benefits costs are. When we look at other departments, we don't even see a, multiply it by 25% or something that fringes. So we get a, a fuller sense of the staffing costs because you've got the larger piece. So I was glad to see that in, in those budgets. Thank you. Just, just one quick thing. I mean, we are looking at multiple story buildings. We have broken the, but we have broken the site down for the DPW but what we're looking at is a site that's not going to serve for 20 years. It's a site that will work for the future. So even if we build a building which is three stories tall and all the admin functions are on the top two stories and shops are on the bottom, we still have to know where all the layout is for the equipment. And those layout areas, which may someday hopefully be built into buildings, because we've actually gone to the point where we're just gonna have everything outside basically, except what has to definitely be inside. You still have to account for those future things. So if you took away that we're not even thinking about going up in the air and we're just trying to be spread out everywhere, we're we're really not. And 
uh, I'm just going to say that if we want to have a committee, great, we can have a committee um, and work this out and push a little farther. Maybe we'll go a little faster. Council Hannity. Um, thank you. No, and and I know that's for discussion later. And I don't know whether I don't think this is a Guilford Amy question, but it's an enterprise fund question that I sent in late and it didn't look like it made it to any of the documents. And it's about the transportation fund. Um, that whoever needs to answer it in writing would be great, but I wanted to make sure I got it out. I noticed the transportation fund was um using retained earnings to essentially cover what it looked to me like 15% of its expenses. Um, and so I have a question about whether that is sustainable um, or what is the plan to reduce the use of, if it's not sustainable, to reduce the use of retained earnings to pay for the expenses from the transportation fund. And I just wanted to get it out there before I know we have to move on on other things. But there, there is a memo on the response on the transportation fund, which I have not had a chance to read. Um, which we got just a very short time ago. So it's there. And those questions, um, Jen LaFountain would probably be better, or maybe Holly can speak to those. Holly has her hand up. Holly? I can I can very quickly speak to the transportation one. Um, and the, the reason why we had to use $136,000 worth of retained earnings in this year were for one-time purchases for capital. So we had $144,000 worth of capital requests in this year and not enough recurring revenue to cover those. So the retained earnings is for one-time purchases of capital. It is for a new vehicle. Um, was the big item that was needed and um, some additional parking kiosks, um, painting and uh, repairs to the elevator in the parking garage. Thank you. Anything else on uh, DPW or enterprise funds? Okay, uh, Councilor Haneke. Sorry, just one more for potentially later. I, we've heard about the, about the staffing situation and and the potential need for staffing for stormwater for, you know, other other things. Um, maintenance of athletic fields. Uh, that question was there, but didn't have an answer to it. So if you could later on or send us later thoughts on how um the potential or what i guess i asked it as the level of maintenance is doable within the current budget um versus what is being asked as potentially or talked about for later if you could just expound on that somehow about what what the level that has been discussed potentially with the redo of track fields and all of that what that would look like within your budget or your personnel as we move towards those conversations, potentially at later meetings regarding funding of track, it would be great to have. But they, that was a late that was a late answer. I I got Alan's note to give his his piece to that, and then I added some more to it. So I sent that on later. Um, but quickly, just the part I put on there, so I can pass it on, is you know when we were asked to do a plan to maintain the fields, we actually came in with three pieces. We had a capital piece. That we needed, we had a personnel piece we needed, and we had an ongoing, so, well, ongoing maintenance, which is ongoing materials. Um, capital piece was funded, the personnel piece was not, and the materials part was not funded. So that's where we're starting this year. The capital equipment is all in, but we weren't. The request for additional personnel did not happen, and then the request for additional material did not come forward either. So. We'll be scrounging around trying to make things work and adjust things for the next year. And hopefully in the next budget, we can probably get some more material at least in so we have the material we need. Uh, Mandy, this wasn't in a document. It was in the email that, that I sent you. If you scroll down, those responses are there. Thanks. Any other questions or any issues? Okay, why don't we, uh, wrap, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, Guilford and Amy, and um, we'll uh, move on to the regional public schools. Um, Thank you, goodbye. So uh, 
Paul, did you want to uh, say anything about the school budget? Um, yeah, sure. And so the, um, you know, the regional school district had asked for an 8% increase um, or a 6% increase, I'm sorry. And uh, we had submitted a budget of 4%. And we have been, just so you're aware, we're looking at different funding options to 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 achieve that gap, that additional two percent gap. Um, you know, the only sources that we really have are one-time funding, so it's, it's something that we'd want to. Um, we're going to dig into a little bit more to figure out um, what that would look like in terms of um, in, in terms of increasing the base for the school district, which we are. I think that the budget coordinating group later this week, we're going to talk about, look at some projections in terms of what does it mean to the town's overall finances if you increase and build into the base an increase of 6% versus 4%. And our goal is to have that present presentation to the BCG so everybody, all the elected officials can, can see what that looks like. Um, I do recognize that, um, you know, we have a brand new superintendent coming on, on board. Um, they're going to have a, you know, they, there's a, there's a ramp up time. You have to give people time to get their feet wet and presenting them with a challenge, very challenging budget situation right off the bat is probably not a great thing. And so that's why we're working pretty hard to figure out where that 2% would come from. We're looking at ARPA, quite frankly, as this primary source, um, the impact there, but there's every, every choice you make to support an operating budget means that there's a consequence. And so that consequence in this case would probably be in terms of the um, solar panels at the Fort River School um, that we would reduce and uh, to be able to meet this, the, um, the operating budget needs of, this, of the district. So that's, I just wanna sort of say, put it out there, like that's, that's where we're thinking. Um, and with the goal being that if um, we were to move that direction, you would see a revised budget request from the town manager to the council that the council would then uh, act on or would have an explanation for how we would reach that uh, additional 2%. Okay. Kathy, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I guess, Paul, I had hoped we would hear a range of potential options for financing. As you know, I, I sent you some ideas. So my question is not, um, don't use ARPA, but if there are alternatives, will the council have an opportunity to weigh in? I am, I'm, I'm totally in favor of going to the six percent. So I understand the issue is both how to fund it for FY twenty five, and then worry about FY twenty six um, and where that money comes from. So, so going to BCG is is one route to go, but I think. Ultimately, we're going to have to figure out how to finance it at the at the council level. So, when when is that discussion going to happen? Because we are due to write a report, and and I'm I'm squirming here because my draft sections for the finance <laughs> report to the council happen to be the regional school and the elementary school. So right now I have this. We recommend that. And, and and a series of blanks. And um, I've got the $355,000 in a couple places. And here's where the money could come from and then raise them. So it's a timing issue on a getting more information. So one way I thought of drafting it is here are potential financing sources and those will be determined later and I was going to just do bullet 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 <laughs> but but I don't want to do that without being informed by what you and the finance your teams are are looking at um so so that th that's a long way of saying I thought we would get more today than what you just gave us yeah so we don't have more today I mean again we've been Sandy Pooler has been away for a week, quite, quite frankly, so that's part of it. But also, it's the council's role is to appropriate the funds, not to identify the funding sources. That's that's our responsibility. And so if we, you know, in, in, the, in the requirement is that the budget be balanced. If I can deliver you a balanced budget based on the um, guidelines of, from the council, then um, then it, the, council's, the council, when it votes, um, 
really just it does vote the appropriation level and you know welcome your ideas i mean always um because you're always thinking about those things bob can i just yeah. um just follow up on that is our role but we're also having we're being asked to consider the capital fund and the capital plan yes. the capital plan has a 12 month debt service line item for the jones library and as mm -hmm. far as we can see there won't be 12 months of it so we're going to be asked to approve that as well. So when I, I say, we may not say take it from here or take it from there, but some of these things are interactive with other decisions we're being asked to make. So th that's that's where I um, think of the appropriation role is looking interactively with other budgets. Um, that's it. Yeah, no, but I understand that. But I, again, the council's, you know, we're, the the capital budget has a goal of ten point five percent, and so you, what you're suggesting is taking some of the capital, the one time capital funds, and putting it into an operating budget. And I think that that's not where the guidelines have been. I, I realize that would be, and they were guidelines set by the council. So I guess mm -hmm. I don't feel like anything is in cement right now. But in any case, if it's if it's cemented, <laughs> you know, it 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 just means it may warrant a discussion on whether. Mm -hmm. it's I understand that would mean capital wasn't 10.5. It was 10 point something. Um, yeah, I, I do understand that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councilor Haneke. Uh, I got a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts. Um, and my questions, I think, are going to apply to Paul, but then I'm going to try and ask some for our, our school committee members and superintendent that are here, too. Um, so bear with me as I think through some of this. Um, Paul, you just said if you're moving in the direction of funding it through something like ARPA, you would submit us a revised budget request. Um, meaning, does that mean you're trying to not have to make the council use the um, MGL that allows the council by a two thirds vote to increase one budget area and decrease another area. So that's sort of question number one. Um, question number two, you just said that the council's roles to appro appropriate not identify sources, but the council does have this option of using the MGL to increase one and essentially identify another line item in the budget to decrease. And so I think that's where Kathy's question is going of hoping to hear other options because um we could decrease another line item that would include um it, it could be the elementary school line item it could be the opeb line item it could be a capital line item it could be the municipal government line item it could be a combination of all three i'm throwing a lot out there so that no one hates just me um, <laughs> you know, sort of everyone can say oh i don't want to do that one but um you know, that that 355 could come from a number of different ones. And I think this committee is hoping to hear your thoughts on each of those sort of potential options of if the council were to use that one. I do appreciate you trying to find a way where we don't have to use that one. But, you know, that option is always there. Um, if we don't use that, if you submit another budget line, another logistical question, do we need another public hearing on the budget? How does that work under our charter? And is there enough time for that if another budget is actually submitted or, you know, that, how does that process work? Um, for the school committee members, um, one thing Paul just asked or put out there was using ARPA, including or more particularly the potential of not building more solar on the Fort River school site, which would have an effect of if we had used ARPA for that, instead of potentially using it for one year of operating at the region, the elementary would, if ARPA was used for that solar, would incur and reap the benefit of lower operating costs for 20 or 30 years. What does the school committee think about losing that 20 or 30 year decreased operating cost at the elementary level in favor of one year of increased operating costs expense you know funds at the region level um another question is the three towns have that have voted this budget and this assessment method have all my understanding is they have all found the money through savings through one-time non-recurring revenues and it sounds like our 
our executive branch is seeking to find the money also through one-time non-recurring revenues. What is the school committee's position on that not becoming the base then for the next year? Because as we all know, using non-recurring revenues as the base for operating fund increases has put us in this position um, of massive decreases. So, so what is the school committee's thought of keeping the base at the 4% level that was originally um, four towns agreed, but accepting the 6% level next year, but realizing that the base needs to begin at an increase from a 4% level because that's what's built into each of the four towns' operating budgets, recurring revenue operating budgets instead of non-recurring revenue operating budgets. Um, for now, I'm gonna stop there, that's a lot. Already? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I can address the ones that were started towards me. So um, the council has the ability to override the budget by two thirds vote if it makes reductions. You have the authority to reduce any line item, you know, any any item as well. So those authorities are with the council. That's your decision. Um, you know, and if we again, I haven't. I, I'm putting out there that we're looking in this. We don't have confirmed a recommendation to you. I, all the different options are are looked at. We would recommend against using, um, reducing our um, 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 OPEB uh, funds. We recommend it against a certain number of things because we think that's bad policy. And also we just went through a bond rating, which we, we were successful in renewing our bond rating at AA+. Plus. Part of the our major argument is that we continue to contribute in a responsible way to our OPEB obligations into our pension obligations. I think dipping into that is damaging to us, especially when we're entering an era when we're going to be going into bid, going out for bonding in a significant way. But again, you have the authority to override, to override the budget uh, request by two thirds vote for the school department if you so choose. You have the ability to reduce any, you know, the, the budget as you see fit. Um, you know, right now I put out that I would submit a revised budget. It may not be necessary to have a revised budget if we do fill that two percent with ARPA. That's a that's a does not may not have to be a separate process. If there is a revised budget, does it require a um, a public forum? Uh, it's a good question. I don't. You know, we've talked a little bit about that, but we haven't really dug into it in terms of exactly um, what the format would be. But there is time to to address that. Um, so I think that. I tried to address the ones that you that I'd written down, and 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 just sort of something you you asked the, the school committee about is you know it's not a good plan to be um, funding operating budgets on with one time money. It's a bad plan, um, but we recognize the situation that we're in. We recognize the um, constraints that the school district is in, and the sort of challenging management you know, with a with a brand new superintendent coming in. So totally recognizing that and seeing that this might this is this is these are extenuating circumstances. Um but um we and that's why I would be recommending that we look at, you know, bringing everyone to the table to really look at what is the long term sustainable plan when by definition our our revenues are constrained. Um and um by proposition two and a half, and um, and what is our plan as a community? Because everyone, schools are are, are, are very valued, as everyone knows. So um, I think that's an important piece of this conversation that we're that we continue to work at this together um, as a as a both school committee, school officials, town council, town officials, things like that. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, and I appreciate the discussion that we've been having. I look at this from my years of working on this as needing to be addressed as an FY25 issue, um, and that uh, I therefore do not like the idea of getting into the discussion of the base, because I'm not sure that it has relevance to anything in the end when we're going to be dealing, when we get to dealing with FY26. I think we really need to address the question of, is this something that's necessary and appropriate to do for FY25 
and how do we go about doing it and if we do it. And I think that those are the things that I would like to focus on and let FY26 take care of itself when we get there. But I would very much be encouraging the school committee to not use its usual method. I think that um, that usual method of developing budgets has created a crisis that has exhausted us. And that is to take level services, figure out the cost of level services, and then make adjustments to a level services budget. I think it's time for the school committee and the um, school administration to think about a different methodology for beginning the budget discussion because um, this has created a crisis year after year where we just have continued to um, handle budgets one year at a time and let our decisions be made on what programs to be cut on a year-by-year -year basis as opposed to with a long-term vision of what we're going to do. And I realize that we're coming in with new superintendent. And I welcome a new superintendent bringing fresh ideas to it. I think we need to start a process, but we need to make sure that we involve our new superintendent into being a real voice in that process. Um, the other things that I just wanted to um, bring up just really quickly is, um, you know, I, I heard the presentation that was being made uh, by Kathy regarding um, possible changes in the um, capital budget that result from decisions that might be made with the library. There are a lot of um, factors with the library. I think it really opens up um, such a huge topic and so many unknowns and I only have to cite back to the, to the discussion that was reported in the newspaper the other day about the cost of doing um, the repair option B, if the repair option B becomes necessary. We um, have no real information that it's going to allow us to, to make appropriate decisions. I think we came to 10.5% worked for years to get ten to 10.5% on capital because we realized that the town was not being served by not getting there and um, that um, it would be um, short-sighted to use a one-time opportunity to take money away from that source when there are so many things that have to be done on capital, not the least of which is uh, roads we drive on every day. And uh, I guess the last thing that I wanted to just say is that this morning we had the monthly fiscal policy committee meeting of the MMA. And the issue that we are confronting here and that we have read about in uh, uh, so many districts in neighboring communities in Western Massachusetts is not a regional issue. It is a statewide issue. And um, there certainly, uh, with uh, Senator Comerford being one of the leaders, um, had efforts to try and think through long-term solutions, but long-term solutions don't get here in the short term. And um, we are going to have to be um, factoring that in as we go forward. So. Those were comments I wanted to make. Thank you, Andy. Bridget, did you want to weigh in? Well, um, yeah, I just wanted to say a couple small things. Um, Doug can give you the numbers, but I remember from the four towns meeting that he showed the difference between if we added the amount to the base or if we did not and what that meant for the long-term sort of school budgets. And so I may, I may need to talk to Mandy um, offline, but my feeling is that the other towns included it as part of the base. So um, so we would be the outlier there if we used it as a one-time fund. And then just in terms of like, um, we're here with our regional school committee hats, so we can't you know, put on the Amherst school committee hat, 
and say whatever. So, but obviously I think in all the school buildings and especially in my role at the region, but on the elementary too, the more sustainable we can use operating funds to increase the sustainability of those budgets, the better. So I, I don't like the idea of, you know, using the solar panel money at all. Um, and the very final thing I wanted to say is I think the Senate was going to vote even today. And so there might be a little bit more money there um, in the rural school aid and the 110 that Senator Comafort was looking for. So um, maybe someone has more updated information than me. I've been at work all day, but, um, but I know that was going to happen today. And there's just one final thing. I wonder what the timeline was of going up to 10 and a half percent in how that aligns with the with the timeline of the schools getting less in the budgets. I haven't looked at it. It's just a question that popped into my head. So um, I think the very final thing I would say again is just if that big question of that each department getting 4% is really an interesting question because do we prioritize equality or do we pr prioritize equity? And I do think like every department has high needs, but the school needs right now are out of proportion to anything we've seen before in education. Thank you. Kathy, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I just, um, I want to just weigh in, Paul. I mean, this is more direct to, to you in terms of ARPA. Um, the, uh, as Mandy very quickly rattled off, the solar money not only potentially generates an offset to the utility costs in the school, we get a federal rebate on it once we spend that money. So it's not a million dollars we're spent. We're spending a million dollars, but then we're, we're saving, we're getting another thing back. So it's a phenomenal investment. So you have two other batches of, of ARPA money. And we have to designate them by the end of the year. We don't have to use them by the end of the year. One is a youth center where we've never quite figured out what that money is. And one is a large chunk of um, for uh, banks. And so I just really urge you, I'm not against taking it out of, of, of ARPA, but just really to think on where is it coming from? And it's that piece. Then the other... Um, this is this is directed at regional schools a little bit. Um, we've got before us a some choices on the track and field project. And when I looked at what I'll call option two, the middle one that gives us a restored field and a, but doesn't rotate, if you took uh, a piece out that could be funded later, mainly lighting, um, and plan to go back to all the towns for CPA money for lighting. You you don't get three hundred and fifty five thousand, but you get pretty close. And if we thought of it that the towns piece was nine hundred thousand of free cash, so if we do something less than that toward it with with that as a new different source, it could then go into the regional budget. So I'm just putting this is Kathy thinking over the weekend on where could the money come from, you know, on here's a piece and here's a piece and trying always to get to three. I don't get up to 355, but I get up to a big chunk and then the ARPA money could supplement it. So just trying to think of ways of getting the most. And, and so I, um, with the solar, one of the, one of the, we have enough, just so everyone understands, we have enough for the Fort River school. It's in the Fort River School budget, enough to offset all of the energy costs. So we just went through that today again in the sustainability. This would be in addition, and we haven't quantified it yet, but I've always thought it could probably offset at least Crocker's utility, electrical utility. And we can get, at some point, we can get a more accurate number. Is it Crocker and part of the school system? You know, we don't on how many panels are we buying for how many kilowatt hours, but thinking about it as offsetting costs. And we just went through a budget poll where all over the place saying, this is a little bit lower because our solar fields helped with the enterprise funds. This is lower because our solar fields help with the electricity. I mean, that's a direction of a return that keeps giving um, that's not one time. So I just really think we should be very careful 
even if I have no say about it, I will keep asking the questions mm -hmm. about it in terms of making really wise choices in terms of return. And, and I think of it, an investment and a return mainly with solar because it's not just you you spend it and it's gone. It keeps giving back to you. So I'm I'm finished there. But I just think there are choices. Um, and and so the more we're careful about them, the more we're not causing another problem mm -hmm. or or giving up on something that we really wanted to do. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Bernie? Yeah, back um, back when when there was a discussion about artificial turf versus natural turf and the costs and all that, um, my sarcasm gene kicked in and I uh, made the suggestion that if we were going to play on natural grass, then uh, we should probably play with natural light. Uh, and I was pleased to hear Kathy just suggest that you could take the lighting out and, and do it later. So there's there's a theme here, I guess. Um, I, I'm always concerned about using one time only money for any kind of ongoing operation. Um, <clears throat> and I think it falls to Paul to do a upside downside assessment of each choice that he's considered um, for funding the $355,000, which I firmly believe should be a one time only gift. Uh, I heard from several members of the school committees, uh, regional school committee, that um, uh, you know we just, we need this hat, we need to, to fix this, we need to band-aid this because we'll fix it in a year. Well, I, I don't trust that it'll be fixed in a year because it's a difficult problem, uh, and it's one that's going to have to be solved. I think in the methodology that Andy described, where you're going to have to really go to like some kind of zero-based budgeting effort and uh, kind of take things apart. Um, and I do want people to um, not discount the prospect of a $15 million bill for fixing the library, maybe not all at once, but it, it will, it's likely will be there. And I don't want people to discount our bond rating. We haven't bonded for the elementary school yet. Uh, we haven't bonded for the fire department. We haven't bonded for... Uh, the uh, uh, DPW facility, we haven't, we do some mini bonds every year to uh, pay for capital. Um, that, to jeopardize that rating um, is analogous to the analogous to the solar thing. I mean, if you knock the solar out, you're going to lose uh, electricity savings going forward. If we jeopardize our bond rating, um, we're going to pay an in interest costs uh, going forward for the next three decades. Thanks. Thanks, Bernie. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Councilor Haneke? Yeah, I, I want to follow up um, and, and hear from the acting superintendent or interim superintendent and our school committee members. Um, I, in some sense, I agree with Andy of no matter what we do this year, next year the school committee needs to do their in some sense needs to present their budget differently because it is the way it's presented is much different from the way the towns present their budget um paul gets a number of what the town can afford and he fits his budget into that number the schools on the other hand decide what they want and then say, oh, but if the town can only afford this, here's what we have to cut. It's a very, it, at least that's how it appears from my chair as to how that budget is presented. And that creates a lot of tension that we don't see in a um, in the municipal budget. Although what did we just hear in the first hour of our municipal budget discussion? There's not enough staffing. Mm -hmm in our municipality departments to do what we might be needing to do and we're having to make hard choices. Um, but what I'm hearing from the school committee is it would become part of the base and the other towns just voted it as part of the base. Well, yes and no. Um, and that's that's why I think we can't 
not talk about the base number. And that's where I disagree with Andy, because what we just heard from school committee members is it just became part of the base and that's what level services will be starting from. And then we'll see these cuts. But when the other towns have voted to pay for that 2% out of their savings, which my understanding is they have, I don't understand how the school committee can say it's now part of the base when it's not part of their recurring revenue funding. And that's where we're looking at if Amherst funds this extra 2% in 355, a two and a half percent increase from 4% takes us to that 355 plus a little bit more because we can't just dump that 355 that we used say ARPA funds for into the the next year's two and a half percent increase because it's not there in our operating budget this year. Even if we fund it, that's where Bernie's comment of it needs to be a gift is. But if you take it as well, if Amherst funds it at 6%, that's where Amherst's 2.5% increase starts next year. We don't have that anywhere in our operating budget to begin with to work it into the next year. And so I think some of us are struggling with not just how do we find it this year and if we pay for it for out of one-time funds, we're struggling with what is the school committee going to come to us next year when they present a budget that has based their assessment and their level services on a number that isn't sustainable to begin with because it was paid for out of savings this year? And then when they say, oh, but we have to cut 20 or 30 positions, we can't do that. that that's where, to me, that rubber hits the road of, is this really a request for one, one year? And I'm... I keep hearing in some sense, different things from different people of how would we pay for it next year, which which gives me pause of even using one-time funds this year to pay for it because I feel like when the FY26 budget comes in, we're gonna be told, well, we can't cut those positions and well, you funded it last year, but we if we fund it this year out of one-time funds, we haven't really funded it for more than one year. And so I don't see how we can then consider it part of quote level services going on or what the, not, not necessarily level services, but, but part of what the town should be able to afford a two and a half percent increase on in the next year. And so I really do want to hear more from the school committee and the superintendent on whether there's been conversations with the incoming superintendent on how to deal with this, what the plans are, um, even if they're just vague conversations at this point, um, uh, what will we be facing in FY26 in terms of what does the school committee expect us to potentially increase from our payments each year? Um, are, are we looking at an increase from that 6% budget? of two and is it expected to be two and a half percent from that six percent if we pass it or is it expected to be two and a half from the four percent that the towns have built into their current operating budget versus the six percent that two percent of it's not built into recurring funds i know it's not very clear but that's where i'm struggling andy i know you have your hand up but i'm going to give doug the opportunity to respond yeah, I, I'll just share a couple of things. First and foremost, I think part of why we've we've presented our budget the way we have over the years is is partly due to the fact that um, our employees work on the fit on a hard fiscal year, actually a hard school year basis, and so in our contracts we have particular notice requirements based on that. Um, whereas with with town staff, it's a little different, and that's not better or worse; it's just the nature of the beast. But we have notification requirements that we have of whether people have or don't have an employment with us. Um, in our teaching contract in particular, we have to let people know, you know by the 15th of April about whether or not we think they have a position for the coming year. And so we tend to operate from, from that mode. So I think that's part of why we presented, you know, uh, from a level services kind of mindset, um, which is different than... than um, in the town. If, if we did it more like the town where it's like, all right, here's how much money uh, and we fit within that, you know, we're still going to have a conversation about what are the reductions in staffing because we're going to have to notify people about those reductions in staffing. And that's going to matter a lot to um, what does or doesn't happen and what does that change with regard to 
what we offer is a program of studies and that sort of thing. So it, it, we kind of end in the same place. It's a little uh, bit of semantics in some respects. The other thing I'll say is just I, I want to retune people's mindset a little bit about, you know, talking about a base. Um, and it's not to be disingenuous at all, because I think that we, we you know, we put in guardrails in our assessment method over the last few years because we tend to have our assessments grow more greater at a greater pace than 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 our other revenues that come into our budget. So we have Chapter 70 and, you know, tra reasonable transportation and, uh, you know, uh, reimbursement for, for charter schools and, and, and Medicaid reimbursement. We have different sources of funds. Most of those have held pretty flat. But if, um, if for example, we suddenly, but, but what I want to keep in mind is that even with the five-year averaging that we do of minimum local contributions and enrollment, you can have pretty significant changes in your assessment based on just that alone. Um, so you're going to have, you know, as you, you know, when you start looking at the sort of your percentage of the bill, um, you know, we take the total cost of what we think we're going to need to do next year, and we could do that from a zero-based budgeting standpoint or some other mechanism to sort of come up with a number. We're going to subtract out the other resources of funds like Chapter 70 and that. Or an amount to be assessed to the four towns. Uh, and our assessment method divvies that up a certain way. We've used a base of the previous year as a frame to limit that because that's the way most other budgets are, are derived. However, um, you know, we could use something else, but also just note that, that even with five-year averaging, uh, we, can, we can still have notable swings in, in the sort of percentage piece that, that any given town owns in a particular year. So even with five-year averaging, I've seen Pelham have a plus 3% or plus 4% in their piece from an independent of ultimate bound of, of total to be assessed just as a percentage of the total to be uh, owned by that by that community. And, and Amherst tends to have a lot smaller swings because we're much bigger. Um, but nonetheless, we can still have uh, significant changes by virtue of significant changes to EQV, other things the state does. So it, it's, it's not as though the assessed amounts to each are as fixed as they seem. So it's not quite the same of, of sitting with a flat amount that we then build from. It's really an amount that we are <clears throat> estimating we need to be funded by the towns. We divvy that up based on our assessment methodology. Um, and, and then, you know, and then we compare that to, you know, what's, what's happening year over year, because that's a frame uh, of reference that's common to all, all four communities. Um, but I think that, you know, um, one of the reasons we don't do the pure statutory method is because the volatility from one year to the next is really kind of high, even higher, uh, you know, with the with a five year averaging method that we use for both students and for uh, minimum local contributions, we can see swings of the three percent range for a given community with with um, with the pure statutory method it can be even more extreme than that. Um, and you have communities, you know, much smaller districts than ours or or two district you know, uh, two town districts, they will sometimes have a 10 or 12% increase in one year to the next uh, from a pure statutory method. Um, and even though the total budget itself may not go up that much. So we can have small increases in, in the amount to be assessed and yet an individual town can take a huge hit depending on the assessment. Method. So I just wanna have that be part of the context of the conversation um, to understand that there are, it's, it's not purely from a base number and then plus X percent, it's really an assessment method that divvies up an amount we're trying to, to parse amongst all four towns. I hope that's helpful as far as just explaining some of the context. Thank you, Doug. Andy? Yeah, I appreciate actually the, the order you put it in because I guess I had one question that goes back to Doug again. And that is, I'm not sure that I understood where the timing of the budget process and need for layoffs fits in with the development of the budget because budgets are developed earlier in the year and the presentation of the budget in the work of the four town meetings has developed in a much earlier pace working towards town meetings. So the layoff notice date really doesn't seem to fit in with the process or the question of why it would be um, inappropriate at this point to really take a fundamental long-term look at the funding of our schools 
And, you know, I look across the river at our friends in Northampton and what they're going through right now. And Northampton um, has had a much better um, track record, I think, in some ways, and certainly East Hampton has, of thinking through a long-term plan for schools that they've been able to do because they're single communities supporting their school. But um, as a region, why is it so much more difficult for the region? The other thing is that uh, Brid Bridget earlier had uh, um, said, well, gee, we're about to enter the conference committee process and the legislature, and there's hope that we're going to see um, some increases that will come from more regional school fund, uh, small small school funding. So, and uh, the uh, of course we're looking at what's going to happen on the dollar level for Chapter Seventy. Uh, those revenues for the region go to the region; they don't go to the towns. And uh, so, you know, we certainly aren't turning around and saying, "Hey, give some of the money back to us." Um, but um, it isn't. Um, it isn't our. It isn't helping us other than what we're going to get from uh, increased Chapter Seventy that will allow us to do um, to have a little bit more flexibility when we talk about um, the elementary school and the budget in general. And we have generally not separated out the um, funding that comes from Chapter Seventy from other funding. Because in the end, the town gives so much more to education than uh, we are required to by the state. We are so much above the uh, uh, minimum requirement that it is an irrelevant number. Um, and uh, so I think that we really have to uh, cheer on the process in Boston that will happen, do our best to provide comments, but not um, think that it is in any way linked to difficult decision that we have to make. Doug, did you want to respond? <clears throat> yeah, just a quick, quick uh, additional thing I would talk about with regard to to the sort of notification. So, you know, we met as a as four towns in February, and we did that before the the sort of public hearing process for the regional budget. Um, while we didn't have specifics of what would be cut, we did have and tried to have as accurately as we could um, some estimate of the FTE reduction that we'd need to do to, to be at that 4%, which is where we had had conversations when we met in December. So um, I think in, in, in other years, we've, we've had the, the hard conversations about what, what's at risk uh, in, those, in those sort of January and February uh, four towns meeting. I think that while we weren't specific, you know, the writing was on the wall with regard to the FTEs that were at risk. Um, when you start talking about five, six, seven FTE, and, and this is on all of us for not, you know, sort of recognizing the sort of impact, it, 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 you know, it's going to be programming that people care about deeply. And so I think that it behooves all of us in, when we, when we're meeting and even December, you know, we had rough estimates then, but they were, they were much rougher and, and fortunately uh, got smaller over time, but, but, um, you know, we need to be, aware of that sort of order of magnitude without the specifics, because I think it, it does dictate to us uh, the sort of kinds of changes that that are at risk in those. But I, that's not to disagree with with Andy's point about the the idea of being more uh, systematic and and longer range and thinking about, you know, sort of uh, how we how we think about our our needs and, and our programming and what we're, we're going to maintain regardless. You know, so I've been thinking about that a lot recently as well. And think about how do we be more uh, clear about what our uh, objectives are long term? How does the uh, financial picture fit within that? How do we maintain that over time, given the pressures that we've we've talked about this year in particular? But just want to mention those those couple of things to to share a little bit and 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 uh, and remind us about you know sort of even even as early as February when we were talking about you know FD reductions, we didn't know which ones, but in some ways it doesn't matter because it's a it's going to be stuff that's pretty important when you start talking about five, six, seven staff that are teaching staff. So um, I just want to have us all keep that in mind as we as we look at these things. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Bridget. 
Sure. So, so I'm, you all know, I'm pretty new school committee member. And so I went to statewide training and they had the statewide budget person come in. And I just wanted to share what she said. She said that the level services budget was the best practice for school committees and that it was best practice because we have a legal responsibility to balance the educational quality and the fiscal responsibility elements of our position. And because we report directly to the voters, it's important that we're transparent because when someone shows up next year and teacher X or program Y or thing Z is missing, what happens is we're breaking trust with the community and the sort of voters. And so thus, that's the reasoning behind the level services budget. I have to look into the other types of budgeting to even know the pros and cons of those at that sort. But I just wanted to share that with you because that was new information for me of how they do it and the reasoning for why they do it. And then the second thing I wanted to say is we're, we're overdue for our school improvement plans. But in um, our new super mentioned in her interview that if she was looking at budget cuts, that her approach would be to look at the school improvement plans, align the educational data in the schools to see where what programs we have are being most successful, which are not, and how are those aligning with our educational goals that we have there in the school improvement plans. So it would be really sort of a building by building process of looking at where are there some efficiencies? Where do we need to make the case for more spending, et cetera, to do well and reach those goals under the school improvement plans? And it looks like Doug probably has something to say about those. He's leaning forward. Okay. Uh, any other comments? I think our time is up. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. I'll second. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, motion to adjourn is on the floor. Uh, I'm an I, uh, Bernie. Yes. Uh, Mandy, uh, Councilor Haneke. Aye. Andy? Aye. Alicia? Yes. Uh, Matt? Support. I think that's everyone. All right, it's unanimous. Oh, Kathy, sorry. Yes. <laughs> All right, it's, that's everyone. Everyone, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll meet again on Friday. Um, also, um, what we're going to do on Friday is review what we have of the report. So uh, if you can get your sections to me, that would be great. Um, I recognize that uh, Alicia, for example, your stuff is going to be uh, on the on the agenda for for Friday. So you obviously can't write up write anything up, but we do need to uh, to try to get this going as fast as we can. So again, thank you very much, everyone, and we will see you on Friday. Thank you.